Thanks, Tom Peters, who's at, he has a joint position with NDSU and University of Minnesota. Today, he will discuss water hem control in sugar beet. Go ahead, Tom. Okay, I think um, since, since we have Europeans on the phone, I want to introduce water hemp. So water hemp is in the amaranthus family. Um, the species name is tuberculosis and tuberculatus, excuse me. And it's a dioecious pigweed. So there are male and female plants. Water hemp originates in the United States in the floodplains of the Ohio and Mississippi River valleys. So in the states of Illinois, Missouri, Tennessee, and Arkansas. And over the last 10 to 20 years, water hemp has become our predominant pigweed in agriculture. Um, I think the dioecious habit is one of the reasons why it's so common. Um, we see a lot of diversity in plants, but the dioecious habit has also resulted in some significant herbicide challenges and we have resistance to at least five families of herbicides. In um, sugar beet production in Minnesota and North Dakota, it is absolutely our number one weed control challenge. And it is so important to sugar beet production that all of the weed control presentations this morning will focus on water hemp control. Now, um, Mother Nature has a, an interesting habit of getting even. And I've made a number of statements about water hemp that are no longer accurate. And I'm going to go through some of these. So I frequently state that water hemp germinates and emerges in Minnesota and North Dakota the second half of the month of May and that once it germinates and emerges, it continues to germinate and emerge through the month of June, July, and into early August. Well, in 2019, we had germination and emergence and seed production well into autumn. Um, and these are some pictures that exemplify that. Um, these small plants made seed, the seed landed on the soil surface, and unfortunately, we found some early germinating fields in, in uh, 2020. And an example of that is on the left. It's a, a field that Greg Krauss identified near Mapleton, North Dakota, just west of, of Fargo. Now, at first, I was thinking, well, Greg found the needle in the haystack. But I was absolutely wrong. Uh, during it, the next two weeks, we had numerous other examples of water hemp germination and emergence in our sugar beet growing region. So my part of the presentation this morning is going to focus on, on data from three of the four, three of four experiments that I conducted in, in 2020. Um, and I want to start by visiting about our water hemp control recommendations. So another one of my statements, I've stated that if you plant before June, uh, April 20th, that you don't necessarily need to use a pre-emergence herbicide, that you can jump um, ahead to the lay-by program. Um, based on our experience in 2020, we are recommending that we use a pre-emergence herbicide on all of our sugar beet fields, especially in areas where we identify water hemp as our most significant uh, weed control challenge. So we would like for you to use a pre-emergence product, either esmetolachlor, but specifically dual magnum using our 24C recommendation and then ethofumazate, or the combination of dual magnum and ethofumazate, and then follow that with the lay-by program and then scouting the rest of the season. So I wanna focus a little bit on ethofumazate. Um, 
focusing using uh, two experiments that we conducted. I've always been very interested in better understanding length of control from ethofumazate. So farmers will ask routinely if we can get season long residual control from ethofumazate. So we conducted a, an experiment last year um, at two of our locations, the Lake Lillian location and the Moorhead location. I'm presenting results from the Lake Lillian location here. So what you're seeing in the graph is, is um, visual water hemp control over time. And the different lines represent at the fumazate applied at one and a half all the way up to seven and a half pints per acre. So seven and a half would be considered our full rate. And the idea here, and you can see this line that I have at uh, 85%, the idea was to ask the question, when do we cross that line? What calendar date do we fall less than 85% control? And you can see with the six and seven and a half pound rates, that was at about 58 days, 58 days after planting. Now let's look at the one and a half and three. And unfortunately, we never got to 85% control with, with these sublethal rates. So I've made the statement repeatedly that with our pre-program, we want to buy time. That, that's my quote. We want to buy time. And um, these data uh, question the accuracy of that statement. Are we buying time or do we get less than full control from reduced rates? Now, mind you, at Lake Lillian, we didn't have early activating rainfall. So um, we're gonna repeat this experiment and we're gonna see what happens when we get rainfall immediately after application. Um, David, I think if my memory is right, it was about two weeks before we had activating rainfall on this experiment. Now, um, a different question we were asking with the experiments is, do these higher rates injure our, our, our nurse crops? So this is wheat planted across the experiment and you, you cannot see any treatment effects on the wheat. There's absolutely no difference between any of these treatments. So even the seven and a half pint rate did not affect the wheat, which indicates that we just didn't get timely activation of the herbicide. So just a, a quick review of, of nurse crops in collaboration or combination with soil applied herbicides. We uh, believe oat is the most tolerant. It, it, it's certainly more tolerant to herbicides than wheat and barley. At the herbicide side, generally uh, dual magnum is safer on nurse, nurse crops than ethofumazate. Um, ethofumazate is taken up for the roots. That's how it controls weeds. But we see less root uptake on monaceous grass or grass species. So one of the strategies that we've talked about with our, in our seminars is to wait with making the pre-application to give the, the nurse crops a head start if you're using ethofumazate as a component of the pre-control strategy. Now, we also wanted to better understand early season control, both from ethofumazate and dual magnum. And we did a second experiment at the same two locations, the, the Lake Lillian and, and Hickson locations. So, and, and we saw very different results at Lake Lillian compared to Hickson. So first of all, at Lake Lillian, we didn't see any significant differences. Our p-value is greater than 0 0.05, indicating that there was no difference between our herbicide treatments and plots where we didn't even use a pre-herbicide. So the 81 indicates that 81% of the plot area did not have any um, water hemp emergence. Now compare that to the experiment at Hickson. 
where we had a very early germinating phenotype. And um, there you can see that ethofumazate, especially at the four pint rate, gave us greater early season water hemp control as compared to ethofumazate at two pints or, or the dual magnum treatment. And no, I did not have the ethofumazate plus dual magnum treatment in this experiment. So here's a picture. Um, very unusual to have this much water hemp pressure in early May, but that's what we had at the Hickson site. Now I wanna transition to a different topic. I wanna talk about crop safety. And this is with complex mixtures. So it's very common that our early post applications will be a combination of glyphosate, ethofumazate, sometimes stinger herbicide, sometimes a chloroacetamide herbicide, and sometimes Betamex. So it's very common to see a five-way mixture and that could follow uh, ethofumazate pre-emergence. And um, that, that recommendation has worked um, over the years, but it did not work at this particular 2019 location. So in the lower leaves, you can see um, photosystem two damage from Betamix on the lower sugar beet leaves, uh, um, the necrosis on the margins of leaves. And you can also see the, the damage to Stinger. So my team has been working in the field and the greenhouse to better understand complex mixtures. We wanna know if it's safe to be mixing these products together and what the impact is on sugar beet. So likewise, we had another experiment or another um, field observation that I wanna talk about on the left. And these are pictures from Southern Minnesota beet sugar. These are pictures from um, Steve Rail, um, the treatment was glyphosate plus ethofumazate plus outlook. And you can see the speckling on the leaves. And I would say that is extremely likely to occur with outlook and with esmetolachlor. I think that speckling is from the formulation. Now, the question is, is well, what if you add um, a, an, an insecticide, either a sauna or a lores band? are we gonna increase the amount of speckling? And you can decide on the picture on the left if there's more damage. I would say that there's more solvent system, so there might be a little more speckling, but in my opinion, these are not unacceptable treatments um, and this damage is, is very transient and disappears very quickly. But it does beg the question, do we need to add additional oil to those mixtures. You know from my recommendations that we often recommend high surfactant methylated oil concentrate. So what I wanna talk about is complex mixtures. So the control in this case is glyphosate plus ethyl. And then you can see the various admixtures that we're making. And we're looking at growth reduction and also fresh weights. And the data on the, on the right-hand side is grayed out. I, I just want to focus on the six-day evaluations. So you can see there's no difference between herbicides with or without oil until we get to the stinger treatment. And then you can see significantly more damage, growth reduction damage, and also significantly more um, damage associated with having the oil in the, in the treatment. So what we've routinely seen in these experiments is Stinger is an activator. Um, I've called Stinger a bully sometimes where it seems to accentuate the injury from the other herbicides. So we didn't necessarily see a lot of Stinger damage, but we saw other damage, in this case, growth reduction that we're attributing to Stinger. So we're questioning if we should be adding Stinger to these complex mixtures. So this is the main effects. This is just looking at the effect of herbicides. It's averaged over 
with or without oil. And you can see the step up in, in damage that we're seeing um, when we go from Outlook to Outlook plus Lores ban. So you can see we did see more damage in the greenhouse and then a stepped up amount of damage again when we put Stinger in the mixture. So I wanna ask a second question. I wanna, I wanna ask about with or without the ethofumazate pre-emergence. So the same idea of increasing the complexity of the mixtures, this time I wanna focus on the beta mix line, the desmetafam line, Dedafenum, desmetafam plus fenmetafam line. And you can see that we had significantly more injury when we had ethofumazate pre, um, when we added beta mix to the complex mixture. And this is exactly what Dr. Dexter taught us. He taught us that when we used ethofumazate pre, we had to be very careful about the rate of beta mix that we saw. So in general, in my opinion, we don't need to worry about ethofumazate pre with glyphosate, with etho, even with stinger or, uh, or, or with the chlorylcetamide herbicide. But certainly if we add beta mix to the mixture, I think we need to consider the rate, especially in fields where we used out the fumazate. Need to wrap yeah. up, Don. Yep, uh, very quickly, pictures from the greenhouse. Um, the, you can see there's more damage on the right than there is on the left. Um, I need to thank all of the collaborators that we work with and my contact information. So today I'll be talking about um, the hooded sprayer for application of non-selective herbicide and sugar beet. So um, I wanted to talk about kind of the challenges that sugar beet producers face. Um, the first challenge is we're kind of running out of herbicides. We have 17 active ingredient options for in season, which equates to eight sites of action and one being phased out, which is beta mix that Tom was talking about. Another issue is weed herbicide resistance is increasing, um, especially in water hemp and sugar beets are just poor competitors. It takes them a good part of the summer to close the canopy and even when they do, they're pretty short, so weeds can kind of grow past them really easily. Um, and another unfortunate event that happens is um, soil applied herbicides. If you put it on and the rain doesn't activate it or there's little emerged weeds in there already, um, that's when you have to start looking at post control options. So some of the options I've listed are upbeat, interrow cultivation and then I have ultra blazer with a question mark because um, that's not a commercial option yet. Nice. Um, so the weeds I kind of want to highlight in this presentation are water hemp. Um, it has lots of resistance to different sites of actions I've listed on there and then common lambs quarters. And in the turning point survey conducted last year 59% of the acres um, listed water hemp as the most important weed control challenge. So that's what we were focusing on with these experiments. Next slide. So um, the hooded sprayer is a new equipment we tried out this summer. It's designed by Wilmer Fabrication and it's a concept used in cotton. And the goal is to um, post direct apply non selective herbicides in sugar beets. And um, next slide, please. You can see in the picture these hoods run pretty much on the ground and um, there's spaces between them. So the herbicide is getting sprayed between the rows and then the sugar beets just go in between the gaps there. Um, and protects the crop from the spray. And there's one nozzle above each hood. And um, yeah, that's, that's just kind of the setup of it. Next slide, please. So we had two different um, experiments we were looking at. The first was tolerance and the second was efficacy. So the objectives of the first was does sugar beet tolerate Liberty or Gramoxone applied through the hooded sprayer. 
at different timings. And then the second was, does Liberty or Gramoxone applied through the hooded sprayer at different rates and timings control weeds and sugar beets? So in the next slide, I have the materials and methods. The first is for the tolerance. It was a randomized complete block design. Um, our locations, we had three, Lake Lillian, Crookston, and Prosper. And those experiments had six replications with seven treatments. And then for the efficacy, it was also a randomized complete block design with locations at Lake Lillian and Moorhead. And these experiments had four replications with nine treatments. And so the treatment lists for the herb sugar beet tolerance experiment was um, a glyphosate control treatment. And then we had Liberty at three different sugar beet timings, which were the two to four, six to eight and 10 to 12 leaf. And then we applied Gramoxone again at the two to four, six to eight and 10 to 12 leaf timing. And then in the next slide, I have my weed control experiments. So we had our glyphosate control again, and then we had Liberty with two different rates, the 32 and the 43. And they were timed to an early application of three to four inch weeds and then a late application of six to eight inch weeds. And then we had our Gramoxone at 21 and 32 with those same timings. So some of the evaluations we took first for the tolerance, we did sugar beet injury. So that was just a visual percentage. Zero meaning there was no sugar beet injury and 100% meaning complete sugar beet death. We took some sugar beet stand and then we harvested all of the tolerance experiments to find yield parameters such as tons per acre, percent sucrose, and then recoverable sucrose per acre. And then for the weed control, we did that visual scale again, zero meaning there was weeds everywhere and then 100% meaning there was complete weed control. And then we also did sugar beet leaf damage which was counting the number of sugar beet plants within the plot that showed any damage on their leaves. So I just kind of wanted to go over the different damaged phenotypes we saw. So first, um, looking at Liberty, these were um, damaged, showed from sprays made at the six to eight leaf stage. And we observed chlorotic and necrotic lesions. And they started sh to show up um, around five to seven days after the application was made. And what we saw is that these lesions kind of diffused a little bit on the leaf. So there's the spots, but then they spread a little bit. And then there's also the leaf curling, which we think was the leaves trying to grow around these lesions. And then in the next slide, I have phenotypes of the Gramoxone. And these are from treatments made at the six to eight leaf stage. And they were, we saw similar damage with these lesions. However, with Gramoxone, they were um, more spotted. They didn't really diffuse like Liberty. You can kind of see exactly where the spray landed on the leaf. And that's what's shown here. And then um, in the next slide was another phenotype we weren't really expecting to see, um, but we did, and that was wheel track damage. So in the big picture and then the picture on the bottom, you can kind of see those older, bigger leaves and the sugar beet plant kind of got trampled from the wheel tracks. And then in the other picture, um, this equipment kind of is similar to inter-row cultivation where you need to keep focus because if you get out of the rows, um, for example, up at the top, the hoods went over the sugar beet row and it was kind of a chemical cultivation. So moving on to the results, I wanted to talk about the growth reduction and then the damage. And again, that damage was the number of damaged plants in the treated rows. So just to kind of give you um, an idea of the total plants within a plot, our stands were about 200 to 250 per 100 feet. Um, sugar beet stands and there were four rows per plot. So these numbers in the damage column was just us counting those um, sugar beet plants. So we did see some growth reduction at Lake Lillian, but this summer was kind of a battle with the wind. And so when our treatments needed to go on, it was a little bit windy at Lake Lillian um, and we thought the hoods would offer a bit more protection than what they did. 
So the numbers for growth reduction and damage were a little bit higher and we credit that to the wind. And then um, for damage, it was significant across each location. However, um, Crookston had more wheel track damage that was observed. And then again, Lake Lillian um, with the wind. And then the next slide just shows our yield parameters. So we have tons per acre, percent sucrose and recoverable sucrose, and there was no differences across treatment. Um, one thing we did see was there is a trend with injury and yield reduction with applications made at the two to four leaf but overall there was no significant differences across treatment. Moving on to the water hemp results. Um, again, we made the early and the late applications and we didn't combine the two locations because the Lake Lillian um, site with the wind, we were spraying about four to eight inch species. And then at Moorhead, it was two to six inch, so different heights there, but the results were similar. So for Liberty, we saw that the higher rate of Liberty made at the early application provided the best control and it was much better than the glyphosate check. And then for the Gramoxone treatment, we had the early and late and the different rates. And overall, um, we concluded that it didn't really matter which rate or which timing was sprayed. Gramoxone just provided really good control of water hemp. Moving on to lambs quarter control. Uh, moral of the story is that glyphosate controls lambs quarter. So whether you're spraying with a hood or you're doing a broadcast spray, um, the glyphosate control was our best treatment at both locations. And then um, I just kind of wanted to show this image to show how fast acting Gramoxone is. So this application was made um, at Lake Lillian, and this is just after one day. Um, this is what the plot looks like after the treatment was made. And then in the next slide, um, you can see here that the hooded sprayer is controlling weeds between the rows, and it's protecting sugar beets, but it's also protecting the weeds within the rows. And so these experiments were really designed for us to understand what the hooded sprayer can do. So we understand that it can control the weeds, but um, future experiments will look at um, implementing all of our weed control program and trying to control both weeds in the rows and outside of the rows. And then um, I just wanted to show this picture to show that um, the picture on the left was the control of lambs quarters with glyphosates. And then on the right was a gramoxone treatment. And we did see some regrowth from the gramoxone treatments. So in conclusion, Liberty and gramoxone are not approved for post-directed application in sugar beet. That will take regulatory action. Applications made through the hooded sprayer did not reduce sugar beet yield parameters. And then when controlling water hemp, we found that gramoxone at 21 fluid ounces or Liberty at 32 fl fluid ounces applied early improved four to six inch water hemp control compared to glyphosate alone. And then when you're trying to control common lambs quarters in these experiments, glyphosate was superior to Liberty or gramoxone. So in my next slide, I would just like to acknowledge and thank, thank the Sugar Beet Research and Education Board for funding this work. Thank you to site personnel, um, University of Minnesota Crookston, Southern Minnesota Beet Sugar Cooperative and KJ Egg Services, who aided in the planting and managing and harvesting of these experiments. And then also a big thank you to the NDSU team, Tom, Ryan, Brad, and Peter, and then other colleagues for their work in conducting and maintaining these experiments. Um, so one of the questions was, could chemical damage be reduced through the use of different application nozzles in the hooded sprayer? What water rates were you targeting? Knowing both Gramoxone and Liberty are both requiring a lot of water for good coverage. So um, I'll just say it, when we sprayed, we were applying 22 gallons per acre 
and we used an 8002 EV S T jet nozzle. Um, and Tom, if you kind of want to jump in with anything that you have off the top of your head, um, I know we did do some work with different nozzles, and this is the one that we decided we liked the best. Okay, uh, our next presentation is by Miss Emma Burt. Um, Emma is a research agronomist at at um, Mindac Farmers Cooperative, but she's also working on a master's degree. So she's studying the feasibility of, of using acefluorophen in sugar beets. And Emma did her work in collaboration with myself and my team, and also David Mettler down at, at Southern Minnesota Beet Sugar. So Emma, the floor is yours, and I will advance the slides for you. Okay, thanks, Tom. So as Tom and Alexa have both pre previously noted, water hemp is classified by growers as the most important weed control challenge. So we're obviously emphasizing water hemp control and sugar beet, and that is the basis for this project. So the current water hemp control program utilizes a pre-emergence herbicide, followed by a split application of chloracetamide herbicides. The applications are made before water hemp germinates and emerges, usually at the two leaf and at the six leaf sugar beet stage. Um, the use of these herbicides is widely adapted by more than 90% of our sugar beet growers. However, there are environments where water hemp control does not reach 80%, and so then additional methods are required to achieve acceptable control. Um, in previous years, oh, go back, Tom. Sorry. In previous years, um, they had beta mix, but with that being not re-registered and inventories dwindling, we need some sort of post-emergence herbicide option. Okay, Tom. Previous research has indicated crop tolerance of sugar beet to acefluorophen. So acefluorophen is a contact herbicide that is currently used um, in soybean for post-emergence control of annual weeds. In sugar beet, it would not be a standalone program, but it would just provide some sort of post-emergence option. UPL acquired acefluorophen in 2003, and they market it with the trade name Ultra Blazer. We've been working very closely with UPL and they are extremely motivated to get Ultra Blazer registered in the sugar beet market. Okay, Tom. So we conducted experiments this summer with multiple objectives. The first objective was to evaluate sugar beet tolerance. A randomized complete block design with six reps was used and trials were conducted at four locations across Minnesota and North Dakota. These post applications were made to sugar beet at three different growth stages. And we did take this experiment to harvest. And then the following data that I'm gonna show you was analyzed across locations using proc mixed with an alpha of 0.05. So acefluorin was applied post to sugar beet at the two leaf, four to six leaf and 10 to 12 leaf stage. Three rates were tested, eight ounces, 16 ounces and 24 ounces per acre. And then a glyphosate check was included as well. This trial was kept weed free throughout the growing season so that we could focus only on the effect that acefluorphin has on sugar beet. Um, this table uh, is a summary across all four locations. Ratings taken seven and 14 days after treatment. Each plot was six rows wide, but we treated the center four rows only. So when we evaluated percent visible necrosis injury, we compared the treated rows in the center to the untreated border rows using a zero to 100% scale with 100% meaning that the plot was completely brown. The percent visible stature reduction injury ratings were collected then in the same way. So based on this, we can see that necrosis injury was greatest at the earliest application timing and it decreased as application timing was delayed. Also as acefluorophin rate increased, necrosis injury increased as well. Stature reduction injury decreased as application timing was delayed and sugar beet that was sprayed earlier took much longer to recover from both necrosis and stature reduction injury. 
So this image was taken seven days after application. This is the 16 ounce acefluorphan rate applied at the six leaf sugar beet stage. So these white lines indicate the boundary of the center rows that were treated. So if you look um, in the plot there, you can see both necrosis and stature reduction injury. And next. So then compared to this slide here, same 16 ounce rate, um, but at applied at the 10 to 12 leaf stage. Um, and stature reduction is reduced here, but we can still see necrosis injury. Now this graph shows the sucrose content of the sugar beet at harvest. Um, treatments on the x-axis there, and then percent sucrose is on the y-axis. While there's numerical differences, we did not have statistical difference in sucrose content at harvest. So early injury did not translate to significant loss. In fact, um, the 16 ounce rate applied at the four to six leaf stage had the highest sugar content across treatments. Okay, Tom. Now this is root yield. Um, again, no statistical difference here, even though we can see numerical difference. Um, and the 16 ounce rate, again, applied at the four to six leaf stage is just slightly less than the glyphosate check. And finally, we have recoverable sucrose. Um, this is in pounds of sugar per acre. Uh, this is a function of percent sucrose content and root yield. So again, we can see the trend of the 16 ounce rate applied at the four to six leaf stage being the closest to the glyphosate check. And while we do have statistical differences here, the 16 ounce rate applied at the four to six or the 10 to 12 leaf stage was not statistically different from the glyphosate check. So we did see necrosis injury and stature reduction from acefluorphan. The high rate caused more stature reduction injury than the standard rate when applied at the same growth stage. Because of this, acefluorphan should not be applied to sugar beet smaller than six leaves. Root yield, percent sucrose, and recoverable sucrose measurements were not affected by acephorphin as compared to the glyphosate check if you applied at the six, four to six leaf stage or later. Okay, Tom. So in addition to the tolerance experiments, we also conducted efficacy experiments to evaluate sugar beet injury and water hemp control in response to acephorphin rate and adjuvant use. This time, um, three locations were used. Go ahead, Tom. Just to briefly summarize those experiments, acevlorfin at 8, 16, and 24 ounces per acre with NIS provided 38%, 55%, and 66% visible water hemp control, respectively, 14 days after treatment. Crop oil concentrate, methylated seed oil, and high surfactant methylated oil concentrate with acephorphin did improve water hemp control as compared to using NIS. However, these oil-based adjuvants also increased sugar beet injury. Okay, Tom. So our final objective was to evaluate sugar beet injury and water hemp control in response to acephorphin when used in a tank mix. Because this is where we can where we see acephorphin being utilized. Um, most likely on our last lay-by application. These efficacy experiments were conducted in fields with known high water hemp populations so that we could evaluate the percent water hemp control as well as percent sugar beet injury. And applications were timed to water hemp height rather than sugar beet leaf stage. And we did not harvest these experiments. So this table summarizes the results from three locations. Sugar beet injury was a combination of percent visible necrosis injury and percent visible growth reduction. Evaluations were done the same as in the tolerance experiments, comparing the center four treated rows to the untreated border rows. Acephlorophane plus glyphosate and NIS resulted in 76% water hemp control as compared to 55% control from acephlorophane alone 
and 44% control from glyphosate alone. In fact, when both acephlorphin and glyphosate were added to the tank mix, water hem control improved in all instances. Acephlorphin plus glyphosate plus ethofumosate resulted in 90% control as compared to acephlorphin and ethofumosate at 86% control. Acephlorphin and glyphosate and copyrolid resulted in 85% control as compared to acephlorphin plus clopyrrolid with 75% control. But again, injury also increases when acephlorphin and glyphosate are in the tank together. Okay, Tom. This image um, is taken 14 days after application. The, this is the glyphosate check here. Applications at this location were made when sugar beet was at the eight leaf stage and water hemp was roughly four to five inches tall. Um, the orange lines here show the plot boundary, so the center four rows that you can compare to the untreated border rows. Okay, Tom. So now this is the standard 16 ounce acephlorphin rate with NIS. Um, so just acephlorphin plus NIS had increased weed control as compared to the glyphosate check from the previous image. Okay. Now this is acephlorphin plus glyphosate plus NIS. So you can see this treatment provided great control. Not many weeds are seen in between the rows here, but necrosis injury still visible. Okay. And then this is glyphosate, acephlorphin, ethofumosate, and NIS. This treatment provided the best control across the experiment. You can see that this plot is quite clean, but still necrosis injury is visible and a bit of stature reduction as well. Now this is an overhead drone shot of the same location, again, 14 days after application. This is just a really great visual to compare the tank mixtures. Um, you can see weed control is most definitely better in some plots as compared to others, but you can also see injury differences as well with um, more gaps between the rows and even some necrosis from, from the drone. Okay. So to conclude, tank mixtures with acephlorphin improved water hemp control as compared to acephlorphin alone or compared to glyphosate. Tank mixtures with glyphosate resulted in the highest levels of control. However, injury was also greater as more herbicides were added to the tank. But this research does indicate that acephlorphin can be a valuable sugar beet herbicide for post broadleaf weed control. All right. So finally, the next steps, um, there are experiments planned for 2021 with the, the objectives of determining if acephlorphin is safe to sugar beet when it's applied with glyphosate, ethofumosate, and chloracetamide as part of a water hemp control program, as well as if acephlorphin is safe um, and if it contributes to weed management by controlling the later emerging water hemp, so more of a rescue treatment. Um, we will continue to work closely with UPL um, regarding support for a Section 3 label, um, as well as support for a Section 18 is being discussed with um, the co-ops listed there. That would most likely be submitted on a county by county basis in Minnesota, North Dakota, and Michigan. Okay, so thank you for your attention and thank you to the Sugar Beet Research and Education Board for their support of this project. Next presentation is by Mr. Ryan Borgen. So Ryan completed his BS degree at NDSU in the summer of, or spring of 2020. Uh, he worked for us all summer and he's transitioning. He's taking a look at maybe starting a graduate program. And Ryan um, worked with uh, the weed zapper. So Ryan's presentation will be about weed control using electricity. Ryan. 
Okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, first of all, I'd like to begin with an introduction to the electronic discharge system. I wanna introduce and talk about some past and now the present form of this technology. So some of you may have heard of the Lasco Lightning Waiter. A few of you might have personal experience owning or operating these machines. Well, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this technology, it was developed in the late 1970s and gained some popularity in the early 1980s. This machine was capable of producing 50,000 watts and the entirety of the machine was operated and powered on the rear of the tractor. The machine works by providing the copper bar electricity from the PTO power generator. When weeds make contact with the copper bar, it translocates electricity through the plant heating the moisture within the stem of the plant, creating explosions within the cells that provide the structure of the plant. Over time, the popularity of this and the use of this machine started to diminish. So here we are to 2020 and 2021, and the EDS is back, but it's bigger and better than ever before. I'd like to introduce to you the weed zapper. This new form of old technology is manufactured in the state of Missouri. The weed zapper is driven by a high horsepower front wheel assist tractor. There's a few different or improved safety or features this machine offers. For example, as you can see, the boom containing the copper bar is now much bigger and mounted on the front of the tractor. The generator is much larger and capable of producing around four times the electrical output. This machine also includes many advanced technical safety features for operator safety. A couple of components to understand and remember about electricity. Voltage is the amount of electrical pressure the generator produces to be pushed through the copper bar. Amperage is the rate at which electricity flows. And wattage is the combination of voltage and amperage equating the total output. The weed zapper contains actually three voltage settings that are specifically designed for target species of weeds and efficiency. Uh, for example, low and medium are broadleaf settings and grass is the high setting. And the large numbers on the right of the screen just indicate how much uh, electricity this machine is capable of producing, even though it's generally not practical to run the machine at these rates due to susceptible target species or potentially overheating the generator. So the two videos on the right of the screen, I took this summer while I was out doing evaluations. I uh, apologize if they end up a little shaky uh, but I wanted to provide you an up close uh, example of the machine in action. While recording, I remember actually uh, feeling the immense amount of heat these machines produce. I thought that was uh, pretty crazy. And especially when I was out on some 90 degree days. Uh, in the video on the right, I actually was a video I received from a grower via text message while he's making an application at night. And I figured it'd provide a very cool visual. So a couple things to remember or keep in mind while you're watching these videos is just look for the point of contact between the copper bar and the weeds. You should see small flames. Also, listen to the tractor and you'll notice how much horsepower it actually takes to power this machine. Uh, when the tractor encounters a dense amount of weeds or the machine encounters a dense amount of weeds, you'll start to hear the engine pull down. So what are our objectives? Growers may have experienced the introduction of invasive weed species or potentially experienced glyphosate resistant weeds over the past couple of growing seasons. Early weed escapes from soil residual herbicides may have also been experienced. Growers have been creative and open-minded when it comes to possible weed control strategies on their farm. This machine is now available for consumer purchase. There's currently three local sugar bee growers that I know that have already invested in this machine. We felt the need to become involved to help answer questions and figure out how effective the weed zapper is and what its potential capabilities are. 
So there's a few questions we felt we needed to pursue and answer. Determine water hemp and kosher control using the weed zapper. And determining if increasing pass number will enhance overall control. And then we need to determine the viability of water hemp seed at sugar beet harvest. I'll get to that later. So materials and materials and methods. I collaborated with three local sugar beet growers who purchased the weed zapper. I actually conducted my research in eight commercial sugar beet fields as part of a non-farm research experiment. The weed zapper was operated consistently by each grower in each of the fields, except for the individual experience, which I'll talk about later. So Tom and I had to develop a system in which on how we were going to contain obtain consistent data from each field. So we ultimately determined five by five square plots or quadrats that were placed in different areas of field that happened to best represent the weed density within the field would be appropriate. I evaluated these plots one, three, seven, and 14 days after treatment. I measured visible necrosis, wilting phenotype, and percent control. I'll explain the seed samples later on in the presentation. So weed control with the weed zapper across time and locations in 2020. So this is where the data collected from water hemp locations was combined and analyzed. So percent wilting phenotype. So wilting of phenotype actually occurs immediately after application and remains relatively consistent as you can see one to 14 days after treatment. Percent uh, development or visual percent necrosis. This, you see the steady development in necrosis one to 14 days after treatment. S see a significant difference in development at each evaluation period along the way. And here we have percent water hemp control. So this is overall control. To receive overall control, it takes a combination of wilting phenotype and the development, development of necrosis. But well, we also believe that development and necrosis mimics overall control by comparing the graphs. Visual development of injury after treatment. So these pictures will give you the audience a better image of the development of symptomology one to 14 days after treatment. On day one, you can see how the plant is showing symptoms of wilting or pheno wilting phenotype occurs immediately. Day three and four, some bronzing begins to appear as possible necrosis starts to develop. Day seven, wilting phenotype remains consistent and black lesions will begin to appear on the primary stem. Um, day 14, as wilting type continues to remain consistent, ne necrosis continues to develop. And then here's a picture of an untreated plant compared to a 14 day treated plant. And you can just see the significant difference in discoloration and growth reduction. So all these images were collected in the same field and relatively the same area or same plots near Hillsboro, North Dakota this summer. So water hemp control across treatment in Cragness, Minnesota. So this is where we begin to investigate individual treatment applications. Our treatments consisted of one pass, down and back two passes, and down and back four times, which is four passes. So just looking at the bar chart, I noticed we didn't have any significant difference in control on day one and 14. But the data suggests on days three and seven, we had a little bit of variability. So this particular location in general provided immense weed pressure. Many weeds per plotted area to evaluate compared to our other fields. So water imp control across treatments in felt Minnesota. So we conducted evaluations using two treatments this time, one and two passes. Found a, little, found a significant difference in treatments one to 14 days after treatment. The, this felt location provided far less weed pressure, which may have contributed to the different result than we've seen at our Craigless location. Here we'll compare kosher to water hemp. So we talked a lot about water hemp earlier. Um, kosher is a little bit different and that might, might have had to do with just the overall structure biology of the plant. So here we see that wilting phenotype occurred immediately, but we see a steady reduction over time. Necrosis ended up developing slower which result in overall control ending, ended up becoming less than water hemp as expected. 
And unfortunately, we only had one kosher, loca kosher control location in 2020. So to our next steps, farmers operated the weed zapper from the middle of July into early September. So one of our questions we have yet to answer is how the weed zapper performs late season when weeds are flowering, mature, and contain viable seed. I collected seed for each location beginning or before sugar beet harvest began. The seed received a 30-day cold treatment to, simula to simulate or influence vernalization, and I'll begin my greenhouse experiments in the coming weeks to see if the weed zapper potentially devitalizes seed or provides evidence that application timing is critical. So in conclusion, the weed zapper kills weeds, providing better water hemp control than kosha. The weed zapper kills large weeds where herbicides may not or without potentially injuring crop. Operating speed didn't seem to be a factor and the data suggests that one pass across fields with heavy infestation provided better control where multiple passes provided control in fields with less infestation. So the big question, should a farmer make this investment? Well, along the way we experienced some pros and cons. We believe the weed zapper is an effective tool when approached and used correctly. It's not gonna provide a replacement for glyphosate or other soil residual herbicides. Our project has previously investigated interval cultivation and the use of a hooded sprayer for application of non-selective herbicides. The difference between those tools and the weed zapper is the weed zapper can control large weeds when those tools are designed to control smaller weeds. The weed zapper may reduce the amount of weed biomass in fields, improving harvestability, and potentially the quality of beets stored in piles that could make your cooperative happy. Unfortunately, we believe you already experienced yield loss. By the time an application can be made with the weed zapper, there's already been competition and an interference with sugar beet growth. So I was fortunate to have been able to collaborate and work with a great group of sugar beet growers this summer. So I'd like to thank them. And also like to thank Tom for, providing, provi for providing me the time and resources to conduct this research. Okay. Okay, while we transition, any questions for Ryan? Any questions about the weed zapper? I have one question. Uh, did you are you planning on doing any uh, work on on actual viability or did you do any uh, measurements on that? Go ahead, Ryan. Uh, you you're just talking about the seed mark? Yeah. Uh, yep, we're going to begin working on that last part of the experiment in the coming weeks here. So planting and um, working with emergence and germination. So we're going to do that experiment two ways. We're going to oh, we're going to see see if we have uh, germination in an incubator. And then we're also going to plant the seed in pots to see if we have germination and emergence in a in a greenhouse soil media. So two different ways of estimating the viability of the seed. Okay, let's, let's keep moving. Um, um, the, the next presentation is, is uh, by Dr. Bolton. Um, the title of the presentation is Molecular Basis of Fungicide Resistance in Leaf Spot Pathogen Sacospora beticola. And Dr. Bolton will be making the presentation. And we also acknowledge his team, Rebecca, Jonathan, and then Vivian and, and Dr. Secord. Okay, so today I just wanna give a quick update on our work on the molecular basis of fungicide resistance in Cercospora. But before I do that, I'd like to give a quick plug to our upcoming ASSBT meeting. Um, so on behalf of the American Society of Sugar Beet Technologists, uh, I would, it is certainly my pleasure to invite you all to the 45th, 41st Biennial Conference. As you can see, the Board of Directors had to make the difficult decision to, to make this a virtual platform. But I think as you can see here that uh, this virtual platform does work. And uh, I think it will open up the possibility of getting a lot more um, uh, people involved in the meeting. So uh, for those of you who haven't been to an ASSBT meeting, 
you know, I really think it's kind of the world series of sugar beet research. We have the latest research on, on a variety of topics, agronomy, physiology, genetics, plant pathology, as well as processing. We have some great forum topics. So I really do encourage all of you to, uh, to participate if you can. Registration is open. Uh, you can either jot down that web address or just Google ASSBT uh, meeting and uh, register there. So I hope to see you all there. Is registration free this year? Uh, there is a cost to registration. I don't have that off the top of my head. Okay, thank you. We'll, we'll get in here. Okay, thank, thanks, Mom. <clears throat> okay. There are a few questions in the uh, Q&A &A, uh, section to you previous speakers. So if you could check those out and answer those questions, please. Okay, so Cercospora baticula is the fungal pathogen that causes Cercospora leaf spot. So I mentioned here that it's a hemibiotrophic pathogen only because I think it sometimes is lost on folks that this pathogen, when that spore lands on, that, on the leaf, it actually grows inside the leaf for up to 12 days where you don't even know it's there, okay? And may, maybe even longer, maybe in June when it's a little cooler, that, that pathogen is, is growing inside that leaf for qu quite a long time. We, no one's really investigated how long the, <clears throat> the pathogen is, is inside these leaf spots, especially in those cooler temperatures. So after about 12 days, it switches over to this necrotrophic stage of development where you start to see those leaf spots. It is considered a polycyclic pathogen, meaning that we can have several disease cycles in a growing season provided the environmental conditions are conducive for disease. And as a pathogen, pathogen it is genetically diverse. Um, so even on a single leaf, you will see different genotypes of the, of the pathogen. And really when you take those, th th those three things into consideration, you really have the perfect storm for a pathogen to develop fungicide resistance. So you all know some important uh, management measures, measures for Cercospora really leaf spot. You know, obviously crop rotation is important. Uh, we're getting some varieties with really great genetic resistance. But currently, we still rely on timely fungicide applications. So this is just a snapshot of, of, of really of, of the work from the Gary Secor lab of the last 20 years, um, showing how this pathogen is able to develop resistance to a variety of important fungicides. We have the TINs, the benzimidazoles, where it's a little bit more cyclical. And then in C here, you can see the DMI fungicides, or in this case, tetraconazole. Uh, as, as you can see, we had for several years, very good efficacy, uh, but that resistance factor or, or the ability for the uh, fungus to become resistant to the fungicide, that really started to, to increase in about 2011 and 12. And, and this is a, this is a, this, this particular fungicide has been the focus of our lab for the last several years. Uh, the QOI fungicides you can see worked for a few years, but really uh, we have lost efficacy for those in most growing regions. <clears throat> okay, so just a little bit of background on the DMIs. So these are called sterile biosynthesis inhibitors uh, or demethylation inhibitors. That's why you'll hear several of us call them DMIs and they are in the frat group number three. So what they do is they inhibit uh, the C14 demethylation step in the production of something called ergosterol. So ergosterol is this important uh, component in the membrane of the fungus. So ergosterol is not a protein, ergosterol is a metabolite and it's synthesized by the reactions of 23 different enzymes. So when I think of how ergosterol is made, I think of, a, of an assembly line where you have all these uh, enzymes that will take a simple precursor like acetyl-CoA, make a small modification and hand it off to the next assembly line worker. And at the end of 23 reactions, we get a rather complex molecule called ergosterol. Okay, so why am I bringing this up? Well, he, here again is that uh, ergosterol biosynthesis pathway and these enzymes, erg 10, erg 13, et cetera. These are all our assembly line workers. 
And what the DMI fungicides do is they target this enzyme right here called CYP51. And when, when they target and inhibit CYP51, what we do, what happens is we get a toxic level of uh, ubericol in the cell. And at the same time, we get a decrease in ergosterol. And together, that leads to fungal cell death. Okay, so we've spent you know, several years trying to understand how those resistant strains are able to become resistant. Now, there are several strategies we've looked at, but one of the ones that we think is uh, the best way to look at this is using something called genome-wide association. And this was the project of Becky Spanner, who was a former PhD candidate. Becky just got her PhD using, uh, with this project. Uh, a few weeks ago, and she's already on her first post postdoctoral uh, position in Chile. Okay, so just a quick uh, brief rundown of this project. We collected samples in North Dakota and Minnesota. We did something called clone correction, where we identified unique genotypes. We don't, because this process relies on sequencing the genomes of, of strains, we wanted to make sure we didn't sequence the genomes of uh, of, of clones, we didn't. Uh, you know, they have to be genetically diverse strains. So we clone corrected our our samples. We gave these isolates to the Gary Secor lab, where they um, phenotyped them for uh, DMI resistance. In this case, tetraconazole. And at the end, we received 100 sensitive isolates and 100 resistant resistant isolates. And for those, we sequenced their genomes. So 200 genomes, uh, 200 strains in total that we sequenced their genomes. And then Becky took that data and ran that through her GWAS pipeline. Okay, so uh, believe it or not, this slide right here is the culmination of several years of P uh, Becky's PhD research because it shows us that we, there are five genes, in fact, that are highly associated with resistance to tetraconazole. So on the bottom here, you can see all these, these are the chromosomes of Cercospora particula, and anything above that red line is a gene that's highly associated with, um, with tetraconazole resistance. So, you know, I could spend a lot of time just talking about the details of these five genes, but for the sake of this presentation, uh, we just want to focus on what that, uh, how this information will help the grower, right? Um, we previously published a, pa a paper where we uh, uh, developed a few different, two, two types of assays to um, identify resistant strains. Um, so one relied on this technology called LAMP or loop mediated isothermal amplification. And this is kind of cool because you just take the DNA sample and you drop it in this tube in a tube with the with the right reagents. And if Cercospora is present, or if that mutation is present that's associated with resistance, you'll see a color change in the tube. Okay, so it's a very quick visual uh, uh, assay that will just tell you if uh, yeah if the fungus is present and if it has certain mutations. I will say it does have some limitations which is why we also focused on a probe-based qPCR assay, where we take that DNA from the fungus and we um, put it into the uh, real-time PCR machine. And uh, it tells us uh, very, very specifically whether or not that strain is resistant uh, or sensitive to that particular fungicide. So because of the better sensitivity you get with real-time PCR, we are generally now pursuing real-time PCR as a strategy for um, DMI resistance, for detecting DMI resistance. So the current status of, of this project is uh, Subi as a postdoctoral research associate in my lab. She is taking the information from Becky's work, all those five genes and the mutations in those, those genes, and she is developing a probe-based detection strategy for, all, for those genes. Okay, so it's taken some time here. We, we know what the mutations are, and, we, um, and Subi is developing probes for those, so we can, we can uh, develop this assay further. And uh, for proof of concept, we want to test the qPCR strategy on 400 2020 field strains against their EC50 values. 
So these EC50 values, of course, were generated again by the Gary Secor lab. And uh, when I say Gary Secor's lab, of course, I mean Viviana. Um, but yes, we want to show that, that, the, that our probes are as robust as the EC50 values that uh, were generated by um, Viviana. And really, ultimately, we just hope that development of these probes will lay the foundation for um, you know, timely on-farm identification of resistant strains, right? We wanna be able to not wait at the end of the year to find out what resistance you have in, in, your, in a growing region. We wanna be able to tell you on this particular field, you have resistance to these specific chemistries. Um, and I think we're, we're getting, we're laying the foundation for that all the time. And I think we're getting closer all the time. But ultimately we think that this will make farmers more informed when it comes to fungicide resistance management and ultimately disease management for Cercospora least bar. And that's um, all I have. I just wanna uh, again mention Subi and Becky uh, for their hard work on this project and Gary Secor and Bibiana for uh, their help along the way. And of course, uh, we definitely really appreciate the funding from the Sugar Beet Research and Education Board. Okay, I'm gonna introduce the next presentation then. Um, the, 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 the title of the presentation is Characterizing Cercospora Betacola Spore Germination. Um, the, uh, the presenter is Vivian Rivera Vargas, and Vivian works for Dr. Secor at North Dakota State University. Go ahead, Vivian. I was saying Cercospora leaf spot is the most important leaf spot disease on sugar beets, cause important loss, economical losses, and integrated management is necessary to control this disease, like cultural practices, resistant cultivars, and timely fungicide application, and of course, disease forecasting. Uh, fungicide application uh, is a very important timely fungicide application. Also, first fungicide application is the most critical and usually is based on the calendar, row closure, first appearance of the disease, and false gas. Subsequent applications based on daily infection values that false gas condition favorable for disease development. Is calculating using a parameter like a, a humidity and temperature in the field, and it's based in two days of daily infection values. And when these two days have a value less than six, conditions are not favorable for, this, for infection. And when these values are higher than six, the conditions are the, uh, favorable for disease development. Um, Right now we have two uh, forecast model, uh, Shane and Tang that was developed in the 80s and BIPCAS model developed in 2004. Both of these models use weather data, which is relative humidity and temperature to calculate the disease infection values. Both models predict condition favorable for disease development in the field after the disease was detected. The model doesn't include the condition favorable for spore determination, which is important for early infections. So in our lab, with all the work we've been doing over the year, we observed that germination of a spore growth of mycelium and a spore production can be uh, observed and temperature of say, uh, 10 Celsius over a period of time. So the objective of this um, study was determine the condition temperature, relative humidity, and time required for a, a cercospora reticular spore germination. This uh, hasn't been uh, regularly described. So for material method, we uh, chose 10 isolate that were tested for spore germination. Five of these were fully sensitive to all fungicides and five isolate resistant to all of them. Two wet conditions, free water, and 100% relative humidity. Also, we test uh, four different temperatures, 10, 14, 18, and 20 centigrade, Celsius centigrade. And time of incubation at this uh, particular temperature were two, four, eight, 12, and 24 hours. This uh, study was uh, conducted in growth chamber. In this table, it's just to illustrate that the sensitive isolate really were really sensitive to all chemistry and the resistant were highly resistant. So 
once uh, we start uh, do um, spore production or induce sporulation in the isolate, the spore were collected with the still sterile water and 100 microliter of the spore suspension was placed in a microscope slide. Two set of each uh, isolate were um, prepared. One set was placed right away in the incubation chamber and the other set was air dry before the placement in the incubation chamber. The incubation chamber was uh, at 100% relative humidity and they were placed at the desired temperature. A slide were collected after the each uh, this timing time and the spore uh, germination was stopped uh, by fixing the slide with lactophenol and cotton fuel. A spore degermination data was collected from uh, three replication and a percent of germination were uh, calculated and this used to do a statistic analysis. So this is to illustrate our uh, humidity chamber. This is a big petri plate, which we put in. This is the suspension of a uh, spore, and this is the same suspension, but previously air dry. And in the left corner, here is the uh, humidity chamber uh, closed and with paraffin to keep the high humidity inside. And this is the slide that I'm being fixed for further uh, analysis. When, um, as a result, we uh, calculate the uh, percent of spore germination across all treatment. And we find out that uh, the resistant isolate in general have lower germination compared to the, or the group lower than the sensitive isolate. In, if we consider it as a summary of this study, we find out across all treatment, uh, humidity and time of in, uh, period of incubation, that the resistant isolate have a significant less uh, germination than the sensitive one. Also very interesting in that the germination in free water is really significant compared to just a uh, high humidity. So water is really important for the spore germination. And of course, at uh, higher the temperature, higher is the um, spore germination. And also in time, it's really important, the time of germination, every four hours, two or four hours, there is a big increase in the percent of our germination. So this picture illustrate uh, the germination is the same isolate incubated for two hours and it, uh, 18 Celsius, and we can see the spore is not germinated. This is just debris in the slide, and this is the same spore, same treatment, but in free water, and we can see the mycelia already growing from the apical cell and also for lateral cells. So uh, for the present, for this graph and the following, uh, only we use the data for the free uh, water because the dry really has, is really low germination and we can say it's no significant for the study. So if we see uh, the time, the influence of the time in the spore germination, we can see at two and four hours of incubation, regardless of temperature, there is no significant difference in the percent of germination of the spore. But when we go to eight to 24 hours, uh, sensitive isolates show higher percent of germination over time than the resistant one. Now, if we look temperature across time, independent of the time, we can see at 10 Celsius, resistant isolate have significant lower uh, germination than the uh, sensitive isolate. It's a big uh, difference, which also can be uh, seen at 14 Celsius. But when we get to temperature of 18 Celsius and above, this difference is not significant anymore. So here uh, we have a germination at 10 Celsius, 24 hours after uh, incubation. In this side, we have the resistant isolate. We can see the are germinating from the apical and lateral cells. But compared to the sensitive isolate, we, have, we can see the hyphae have been growing longer than the resistant one. Also other uh, interesting um, observation we have when we're inducing the spore uh, production in the isolate, we observe the resistant isolate, which is in this corner, this size of the slide, they produce a spore faster compared to the sensitive one. 
So, and this was uh, three days of uh, induced uh, of the spore production at 22 Celsius. Also, uh, the other interesting that isolate start, uh, can germinate after two, or start in the process of germination after two hours in incubation and 10 Celsius. And this is uh, how the mycelium start to grow from the apical cells. Also, we find out or we observe that the um, resistant isolate have longer uh, spore than the sensitive isolate. This is an extreme case, but this is sensitive isolate. We can see that in general, uh, short compared to the resistant isolate with seven, uh, 76 microns, compared to the resistant isolate that is a really long cell uh, spore, is about uh, 190 microns. So um, result, high spore germination occur when free water is present compared to germination at 100% relative humidity. Across all treatment, spore from resistant isolate have lower percentage germination compared with the sensitive isolate. A spore from sensitive isolate have significant higher percent of germination at lower temperature, 50 and 55 Fahrenheit, compared with a spore with resistant isolate. But at temperature above 65, uh, 64 Fahrenheit, this, uh, this difference is not significant in the percent of germination. Germination of a spore from sensitive and resistant isolate begin, uh, can begin at 50 Celsius or 10 centigrade after two hours of, germ of incubation. Mycelium growth after germination of a spore is greater from sensitive uh, isolate compared with the growth of resistance one. Early germination begin for the apical uh, spore end, but after eight hours, additional germination begins from all other cells. So as a conclusion, we can say that it's appears there is a fitness penalty for spore germination of fungicide-resistant isolate at colder temperature, which disappear when the temperature increases. Also appear there is a difference, uh, there is a fitness advantage for early spore production that favor, uh, they favor resistant isolate compared to the sensitive one. Also, they have a larger spore and probably more cells per spore. This study might have implication for uh, the forest cast of the disease when uh, combined with the spore trapping and uh, the DIB calculation value. This implies that early fungicide application mo uh, mostly targets sensitive isolate and early fungicide application should reduce and better manage early cercospora verticula germination and infection. Additional work is necessary to adjust the current model to include condition favorable for spore germination and timing of the first fungicide application. Also, we need to uh, study the impact of te intermediate temperature and wetness condition in the overall germination of the spore. And with this, I conclude my presentation. Thank you.